Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about the poetry of Louisa Le Bay, uh, who was a Renaissance era French poet. And she was unique because you can use the pronoun she. Um, in the Renaissance, the overwhelming majority of poets, the overwhelming majority of writers were male. And so Le Bay is really interesting because she is a woman. And she writes in the Petrarchan tradition. So she writes sonnets, uh, that is 14 line form poems. Uh, and the word sonnet actually comes from, I think, the Italian for little love song. And so a female perspective on love is going to be different, given Renaissance gender conventions, from a male perspective on love. So when Petrarch writes sonnets, or when Shakespeare writes sonnets, for instance, then these are the two sort of titans of the, the sonnet tradition, actually for whom the two styles of sonnets are named, Petrarchan sonnets and, and Shakespearean sonnets, or Elizabethan sonnets. <coughs> um, they write from a male perspective about a female beloved. LeBay writes from a female perspective about a male beloved. And so the gender politics are just inherently different. That being said, LeBay's work is not necessarily super, super different in the sort of tone and content and style necessarily from male poets of the day. These are definitely love songs. They are often oriented around praising the beloved, pining for the beloved, or um, desiring the, the beloved who, who does not return the poet persona's love. So these are some of the core things. And I say that, that's a very broad generalization. I'm, I'm reading this out of the Norton Anthology of World Literature, which has reproduced three of her sonnets. Um, so, so that may not be an accurate assessment of the entire corpus of, of LeBay's work, but these are the typical um, subject matter of sonnets. And, and we get them here, just we get them reflected in a slightly different way than we might expect with a male uh, poet, because the speaker here is in a so more socially disenfranchised position. <coughs> so I'm going to read you sonnet, sonnets 1 and 18. I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of these um, and the way that, that these sonnets work. Um, so Sonnet one um, is basically about the duality of love. That is the pleasure and pain of longing, basically. Like wanting the beloved, um, but being, but suffering for not having the beloved necessarily. Uh, so the, the poem goes like this. Not even Ulysses or someone as wise as he would guess that a face like yours so full of grace and honor and respect, such a divine face, could bring suffering like the pain you're causing me. Yes, love, your, eye, your eyes in all their piercing beauty have stabbed my innocent breast in the same place, once nourished and kept warm in your embrace, and still you are my only remedy. Our destiny makes me act like one who's been stung by a scorpion but still hopes to heal, taking an antidote of the same poison. I am wounded. I ask you only to kill the pain, but not to extinguish the burning I crave to feel, this desire whose broken life would break my own. So again, it's, it's this idea that love and desire, while they are pleasant and beautiful experiences are also painful experiences, particularly when loss is involved. As, uh, as the poet once said, every rose has its thorn. Um, so this idea is sort of central to the poem. 
And what's really cool about sonnets, particularly Petrarchan sonnets, is that they move in a distinctive way. Uh, Petrarchan sonnets are broken up into two components. So again, these are 14 line poems. They start with what's called an octave, which is eight lines uh, with an A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A rhyme scheme. Uh, so in this case, the, the rhyme is he is A, grace and face are B, me is A again. So that's the first quatrain, the first half of the octave. The second half of the octave, beauty, rhymes with he and me, T, T rhymes with he and me, so that's an A again. Um, place and embrace, rhymes with grace and face, so that's Bs again, and then remedy. D, T, me, he, if we work backwards through the octave. So A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. What the octave does is it sets up the situation. It, it creates the topic of the poem, which in this case is the pain of love or the pain of loss. Then you get something called the volta, uh, which is, I think, La I think again, Italian for the turn. The volta comes either at the end of the octave or at the beginning of uh, the sestet, which is the final six lines. And the rhyme scheme of the final six lines, the, the, the sestet in Petrarchan sonnets is more flexible. And we'll actually see the two sonnets that I'm going to read you, uh, one which I've already read and 18, have different rhyme schemes at the end. Um, so the volta is the turn. And basically what it does is it moves from the setup that we've gotten in the octave to the resolution in the sestet. And usually this is some sort of shift. We get a transition to looking at things from a different perspective or taking a new angle on this topic and things like this. And that's why it's called a turn, the volta, because we are turning from uh, the octave, which is setting up a situation, returning to a different perspective. So in this case, the uh, the volta is the line is line eight, and still you are my only remedy. The first seven lines, the majority of the octave, is focused on love is pain, my desire for you is pain, and still you are my only remedy. So this sets us up for the sestet, the final six lines, in which the author is seeking relief, but not the loss of love, seeking relief through that love. So this idea, hard destiny makes me act like one who's been stung by a scorpion but still hopes to heal, taking an antidote of the same poison. This idea that it's a, it's a hair of the dog type thing. In order to recover from the pain of your love, I need more love. Um, so in this case, the, the rhyme scheme of the sestet, this is a pretty standard rhyme scheme for a sestet, actually, is C, D, E, C, D, E. So, Ben is a C, Heal is a D, Poison is an E. None of these things rhyme, none of them rhyme with the, the A or B sounds, so this is an entirely new rhyme scheme that's been introduced. Um, Bean and Pain. Don't necessarily rhyme that well in English, but probably in French they do rhyme better. Um, that's very often a thing that we get in with um, sonnets in translation, is that the closest, closest sort of English equivalents don't necessarily rhyme, and so we get these sort of false rhymes. Um, but Ben and Pain, Bean and Pain, these are more or less rhymes. So that those are the C's. Heal and feel are Ds, these two rhyme, poison and my own, Es. So we have a very conventional uh, Petrarchan rhyme scheme here, and the poem is moving in that very conventional Petrarchan way, with the setup of an idea in the octave, then the volta, then the resolution in a perhaps surprising way in the sestet. So very, very interesting, very, very cool. 
again, um, it, it works in this very standard way, but again, it's doing something quite interesting as a poem. Then I want to read, uh, I want to read to you Sonnet 18, which structurally works more or less the same way, but the content is quite different. And I actually think so this is France, okay? And the French are the French are, are stereotypically uh, quite amorous. Uh, the the term French kiss, which we use in English, was invented because I think it was American uh, soldiers in World War II. Hey, these French women are really open to sex. So uh, I'll put that as a preface here. But I think that for the Renaissance, this uh, poem, Sonnet 18, being written by LeBay, who again is a, is a female poet, I think this would be somewhat scandalous. Scandalous. Um, although, in fairness, poetry at this time kind of just circulated in manuscript among small groups of people um, who were intellectuals, artists, etc., etc. So, who knows how how inured to, to scandal they might be, um, since uh, bohemian types tend to be a bit more open, we'll say. So this is Sonnet 18. Yeah, we're gonna, we'll talk about the, what this is doing, the structure of it, etc., etc. Kiss me again, re-kiss me, and then kiss me again with your richest, most succulent kiss, then adore me with another kiss meant to steam out fourfold the hottest hiss from my love-hot coals? Do I hear you moaning? This is my plan to soothe you. Ten more kisses sent just for your pleasure. Then, both sweetly bent on love, will enter joy through doubleness. And we'll each have two loving lives to tend, one in our single self, one in our friend. I'll tell you something honest now, my love. It's very bad for me to live apart. There's no way I can have a happy heart without some place outside myself to move. So again, we've got that basic structure of the octave, the volta, and the sestet. Um, in this case, the, the octave sets up this just obsession with kissing. Uh, we've got kiss me, uh, uh, kiss me again, re-kiss me, and then kiss me again with your richest, most succulent kiss, then adore me with another kiss, meant to steam out fourfold the very hottest hiss from my love-hot coals. Do I hear you moaning? This is my plan to soothe you. Ten more kisses sent for your pleasure. So that's at least 15 kisses um, by line six. That's a lot of kisses by anybody, almost anybody's standard. So... This is the, the thing that the octave is setting us up for. This is a vision of love that is based around physical actions. That is based around interactions based around behaviors. Um, but then we get the volta. We get that turn again at line eight. Um, so the, the latter half of line seven into line eight. Then both sweetly bent on love will enter joy through doubleness. Here we have the shift. We go from love as a set of physical actions to love as a twinning of spirits, maybe, or a, a doubling of self, uh, a, a loss of the self into the beloved. Then we have something structurally very interesting here. Because you, you remember with Sonnet 1, we had the octave and then we have the sestet. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A for the octave, C, D, E, C, D, E for the sestet. Here we have a different structure. The octave is still the same, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, but then the sestet takes us into a different structure. And that's C, C, D, E, E, D. Again, the, with the Petrarchan sonnet, the sestet is much more flexible in terms of the rhyme scheme. The octave is fairly standardized. Um, but I think this is a really interesting rhyme scheme because it's not really a sestet. 
I mean, it is in the sense that it's a Petrarchan sonnet, and so by default it's a sestet, but really it's um, it's a couplet and a quatrain. That is, a, a couplet is a, a pair of two rhymed lines, and a quatrain is a set of four uh, lines with a, with a coherent rhyme scheme. So lines 8 and 9, or 9 and 10, sorry, tend friend, C, C. And this is an interesting bit because we get that idea of doubleness, the, the loss of the self, the blending or, or melding of the self into the beloved at the volta, at lines seven and a half through eight, and then nine and ten develop that idea. And we'll each have two loving lives to tend, one in our single self, one in our friend. So this merging of identities is developed through this couplet, but then we get another shift actually to the final quatrain. I'll tell you something honestly now, uh, honest now, my love, it's very bad for me to live apart. There's no way I can have a happy heart without some place outside myself to move. So love and move, the way we pronounce them in American English don't rhyme per se, but they are rhyme. Depending on your accent, they rhyme better or worse. Um, so those are that's D D, apart and heart, R E E. This is a this is a quatrain, and the quatrain develops another idea. We have the shift. Again, the the octave sets up love as a set of physical actions. The volta turns us to the merging of two identities, which is developed in the couplet, and then the final quatrain shifts to, here are the stakes for me. Here is why love matters for me. So here we get two voltas, almost two turns. Because um, I would say, I'll tell you something honest now, my love, is a turn as well. So we get a second shift. So LeBay has complicated that Petrarchan form in order to make this poem even more interesting and dynamic. I think it's really, really cool. Um, I, it's, I think it's such a fun poem um, because, again, it, it takes that form, the Petrarchan form, that is very, very regulated and regimented. Sonnets are a, a structure, and it makes that structure do additional work. 